part two, three, and MSc semester two and four. Four batches we are having. So these four batches, plus I have also shared the link uh, with the previous batches and also amongst the Platinum Jubilee group developed uh, for particularly for the uh, alumni of our department. So there are two groups, one group uh, having uh, the full strength around uh, 255 and the another group is uh, having some uh, 75, 80 participants. I have shared the link with the group also. And I wish that next month after the Deepavali and Chhat holidays, we may uh, think seriously in uh, fixing the date for the grand function that is uh, uh, maybe in uh, January or February and what would be the modalities for uh, organizing the program. So those uh, alumni who have joined this program, this online presentation, you may keep on uh, sharing the information with your friends. And if at all, any of your friends, they are still not the member of the Platinum Jubilee Group, I think uh, we can have their list and WhatsApp number so that we can include them in the other group. We have also started uh, compiling the articles and write-up for the Platinum Jubilee Souvenir, which we are going to publish. And after uh, this vacation, I have already informed to the students that uh, we'll have several uh, competitive events in the Jubilee year celebration for the undergraduate and postgraduate uh, students. The debate or poster presentation or PowerPoint presentation, quiz and other activities for the students. Plus, we'll have some uh, invited lecture. And it seems that uh, now we are uh, gradually moving towards a uh, corona-free world. So I think in December or January, we can have uh, uh, speakers in our uh, auditorium for the live uh, presentation. So I can see that uh, around uh, 35 uh, participants have already joined on this uh, Google Meet link. And we have also we are also having uh, this YouTube link for the other participants if we number. Uh, so those who have joined on the YouTube. And it is uh, 28 past 11. We can wait for a couple of minutes, maybe three, four minutes to formally have a which we are going to have a wonderful presentation by Mr. Pranayla Ji.
Pranay ji, we'll wait for uh, maybe three more minutes and then uh, we'll start. Sure, sir. That's fine. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Now, I think uh, we may start the uh, online lecture series uh, under the Platinum Jubilee celebration. So first of all, very good morning to all of you. Uh, respected uh, Dr. Arabind Mitra, our senior in the Department of Geology and uh, presently secretary to the scientific advisor to the Prime Minister office. So we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Arvind Mitra today with us joining this Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series. Uh, Dr. Ravindra Kumarji is the undergraduate uh, head of the Department of Geology, Patna Science College. We have with us uh, Professor uh, Anil Kumarji, senior uh, faculty member in the Department of Geology, former head, Science College, and presently he is the Dean of the Students' Welfare at Patna University. So we have uh, all the faculty members of uh, the Department of Geology, uh, Shri Bhavuk Sharma ji, uh, Dr. Saima Jamal ji, uh, Shri Shekhar ji, and few of the uh, our faculty members, they are in the invigilation duty in the examinations also. Uh, so they will be joining maybe after a few minutes or so. We are uh, very happy to have a large number of undergraduate and postgraduate uh, students joining this uh, online lecture series. So all of us, uh, as you all know, that uh, the Department of Geology uh, is organizing Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series since uh, August 2021. We had a very wonderful uh, inaugural online session on 8th of August. And in the last week of August, we had a presentation by Dr. Dipankar Saha on the groundwater scenario of our country. Second in the series, uh, in the month of September, we had a very nice presentation by alumnus of our department, Professor Rajiv Sinha, head of the Earth Science Department at IIT Kanpur. And the third in the series, we are having Mr. Pranay Lal. And uh, we express our gratitude to our alumnus, Dr. Arvind Mitra, who has actually helped me to contact uh, Mr. Pranay Lal for his presentation today. So, uh, I am, I'm having his uh, brief uh, introduction with me, and then uh, I'll request uh, our honorable senior, Dr. Arvind Mitra, to introduce uh, Pranay Lalji. And after that, Pranay Lalji, he will take over for his presentation. So uh, as uh, uh, the information available with me, Mr. Pranay Lal is a biochemist, and uh, he's very actively involved in uh, uh, public health and environment. And he's well known figure in the literary and scientific world with his first book that is Indica, 
a deep natural history of the Indian subcontinent, uh, for which he won the 2017 Tata Literary Prize and the World Book Fair Award. I have been informed that uh, this month only, current month, October 2021, he has uh, come out with one more a very significant publication, Invisible Empire, the Natural History of Viruses, which presents an alternative view on the role of viruses in the ecosystem and the evolutionary history of life. So, as discussed with Pranel Alji, he said that uh, his presentation will be mostly concerned with the evolution of life and also how the life and things have shaped or taken up a uh, geological shape with respect to geological time. So this will be something very new and innovative uh, presentation which we are going to have. So with these words, may I now request Dr. Uh, Arvind Mitra to uh, say a few words uh, for Pranalalji and uh, for the success of uh, the Platinum Jubilee series. And then uh, Mr. Pranalalji will be taking over for his presentation. Sir, Dr. Arvind Mitra, sir. Uh, thank you, Atul. Uh, uh, a very good morning to all of you. And I may add, along with Atul, uh, you know, words of welcome to the third Platinum Jubilee Lecture. I'm really indebted and thankful also uh, to Pranay for having actually agreed to give this talk. In fact, uh, when Atul first approached me, uh, you know, to suggest a list of speakers, the first name that came to my mind was, was that of uh, Pranay, because uh, as Atul just now introduced to you, he is basically a biochemist by training. And, you know, professionally, he is currently involved in, uh, in public health uh, and working on biodiversity. And it is his passion, in his deep passion and his interest in geosciences that has actually taken him over this long journey of exploring the fossil heritage of India and coming out with this excellent book, uh, which... which uh, Atul alluded to. In fact, when Atul met me last week, I handed a, a copy of the book which I had uh, to be kept in the uh, library of the Patna University Geology Department. So here you are, Pranay is uh, with us to give this talk today. Uh, but uh, let me tell you, uh, you know, with Pranay, of course, my association has been in the office of the principal scientific advisor in a very interesting project that we are taking up. It's called the Time, the India Museum of Earth time, right? And this is a, a, a first uh, sort of a geo geological heritage uh, uh, park that we are planning to set up uh, in which uh, Pranay has been very closely involved as a part of the, uh, you know, uh, project uh, preparation team and giving his ideas of how uh, this can be set up and where it can be set up, looking at some of the best examples of similar park that exists in the country. Uh, in other countries of the world. And uh, you would all be knowing, most of you are geologists here, that we have a very rich collection of fossils, uh, but there is no mechanism actually to preserve uh, these fossils in a scientific manner. There's been a lot of actually destruction of these fossils. In fact, there's been a loot of these fossils. In other words, many of these fossils are illegally being taken out of India. So along with Pranay also, there is another major initiative that we took up and that is essentially preparing the Geo Heritage Preservation Bill, which we are currently working with the Ministry of Mines uh, to have this bill in place so that that can really help in protecting uh, the rich uh, geological, uh, you know, uh, heritage which which the Indian subcontinent uh, has. So I think these are two very important aspects which uh, Pranay has been very closely involved with my office. I'm really thankful to him today. Uh, for having agreed to give this presentation. And we all really look forward uh, to hear him in this uh, third Platinum Jubilee Lecture of the Geology Department of Patna University. So thank you, Pranay, and over to you for your talk, please. Uh, thank, thank you, Professor Mitra, and thank you, Professor Pandey, for inviting me. Uh, this morning, I woke up with a bit of trepidation, fear, anxiety, for various reasons. Uh, and the first reason was that, uh, you know, when Professor Pandey told me about the two previous speakers, uh, and I'm being a generalist, uh, I didn't know what exactly uh, should I be speaking today about, although I had shared the topic about which I'll be talking about. Uh, but then I realized that it is uh, such a, uh, you know, layman's perspective about a 
a, a very elegant uh, form of science. And I now feel a little more suspicious of what I'm going to be talking about. So that's one reason why I was nervous this morning. The second reason to be nervous is that 75 years uh, Platinum Jubilee is such an amazing um, journey that has been for the department. And I was just pondering a little, you know, while I was tossing around in the bed, that I didn't know anything about the Platinum Group. I, I mean, I did know something. And I said, oh, I don't know the geological history of how Platinum uh, veins got created. And so I started reading the USGS uh, document 108. And I thought, uh, I must know something about it. You know, the, what is called the PGE, you know, the Platinum Group Elements. And I started reading about that nervously in case somebody asks me that question, I should know something about that. And the third reason why I am in trepidation is, of course, not only being surrounded by people who know the subject much better than I do, but also uh, intellectuals uh, like Professor Pandey, whose papers I've been looking at, and of course, Professor Mitra, who I deeply admire. I think uh, his understanding of science and science communication and the role of science in society, I think is he's creating a legacy uh, and also a template which is going to help uh, India's uh, scientific community in the long run. And I say this uh, without any prejudice or malice because he is a wonderful person, um, frankly. And I really enjoy whatever little interaction I've had with him so far. So I'm not going to take more time. I'm going to uh, just uh, deep dive into my presentation. And please do not uh, take this as a very technical presentation because I'm, like I said, a generalist. So. I'm going to uh, share my PowerPoint with you. Um, so if my screen is visible now, yeah. So I'm going to title my uh, talk on understanding why geology is, and of course, tectonics, such a crucial thing, especially in this day and age. And I think never before, uh, uh, then any time in history has geology arrived on the world stage. And I'm going to try building up my case to tell you that geologists perhaps hold the key to the future of the fate of how climate change and other problems that we face today can be addressed through geological sciences. I'm going to just show you the cover of my book. Um, this is a book that happened because um, I had so many questions as a child. I grew up... Uh, in Africa and then in uh, Bombay. And I had a lot of questions for my geography te teacher, uh, you know, and I used to plague them with questions. Uh, po possibly, um, you know, they might have lost uh, uh, a handful of hair because of them pulling it. So I would ask questions like that if, um, you know, the uh, all the rain falls uh, around Bombay and Goa, why is it that we don't have major rivers emanating from the hills? Um, why is it that the peninsular Indian rivers go eastwards into the Bay of Bengal and not the Arabian Sea? Uh, because the physics teachers used to tell us that water will try to find the closest path to drain itself. So why is it that there are no major rivers between Bombay and Pune? Uh, so, you know, those kind of questions used to fester in my mind. And when I kept, I, I, I hope that I would find somebody who would answer those questions for me. And uh, I would you know, do odd jobs for geologists and paleontologists. I would go for digs with them and say, I will only shovel with you. I just want to listen to all your campsite uh, stories or your dinner table talks so that I can pick up what you are saying and what you're talking. And so, frankly, I'm not trained in geology. I'm a biochemist. I love my biochemistry. But I also enjoy the larger notion of how life got created and why is it that some things exist the way they do. Uh, for example, I had questions like, why is it that we have a very clear line between the place where you find sal trees in India and teak trees? There is a definite line. You know, there's no mixing between sal and tree, tree, uh, teak trees. They don't exist together. But, you know, neither forest, foresters or ecologists could answer this. The answer comes from geologists. The thing is, we have not tried telling the environmental world or the foresters world or the conservationists that what is the deep subconscious control that geology exerts on all life? So my book is therefore a tribute to all the geologists, all the paleontologists who work so hard for the science that they come out with. So my next book is uh, something which is closer to uh, the work I do, which I work on a, in a COVID ward in Delhi for, since uh, March last year. 
but I, I wanted to also correct the perspective that viruses are not all that evil. Of course, it is the pandemic that is, you know, in our minds just now, and it is creating all this image that all viruses are bad and we should exterminate everything that exists. My point being that if you were to ex exterminate all viruses, even for one hour, all life on earth would cease to exist. And I try explaining it to you that the oxygen that you breathe is uh, orchestrated by viral action. Uh, our hands, our feet were formed by a viral infection that happened 310 million years ago. And there's a hint of geology, there's a hint of paleontology, there's a lot of uh, uh, paleogenetics, uh, because I tried to weave stories about viruses from the past to tell you the story of how different creatures exist and why they are so colorful, beautiful, noisy, uh, in found in such abundance and diversity. So the story is about us as well as the story of the virus. Uh, I've been very fortunate that, you know, uh, you know, three very respected people who I deeply admire have given me advanced praise for it and I'm indebted to them as well. So I'm going to deep dive now into my presentation. And I think uh, one of the questions that I used to have as a child was, why does the earth and no other planet have a tilt, right? We have a 22.87 uh, to 23 and a half degree tilt, depending on which part of the orbit the earth is spinning. So this tilt uh, is something that we got before the earth was actually formed. This happened when the proto-earth and uh, a planetary body called Thea collided uh, about 4.7 billion years ago. And it created the moon and the earth. And the earth's molten uh, core is the one that wobbles inside and it actually creates that tilt within the earth's uh, rotation, uh, the, the axis of the rotation. So, you know, these are the questions that actually determine climate, weather, ocean circulation, and uh, and the atmosphere, right? But the fact of the matter is, when we are being taught ge uh, geography in class four, five, six, seven, this aspect of how we got our tilt is never taught to us. In fact, it, we are made to assume that Earth has been like this and the moon has been next to us for billions and billions of years. That is not true. We now know that the creation of the Earth and the moon is rather recent if you were to look at the solar um, system's history. So I think I'll start from here that, you know, this is perhaps one of the most crucial things to have happened to Earth. Had it been not on its axis, our Earth would be very different. So I think that attribute that defines Earth is the molten core, the, the wobbly nature of the core with which uh, creates the tectonic plate movement, and also the tilt that gives us that distinct um, uh, rotation and, and uh, uh, the idiosyncratic uh, way in which the Earth behaves. So I think this is a very crucial part between uh, in the formation of the Earth and the creation of the Moon, and the Moon's own role in protecting the Earth from major asteroid hits. Of course, asteroids were coming and pummeling the Earth left, right, and center, which is what gave us platinum. Platinum came from meteorites and, uh, and large planetary bodies that hit us. So we know that the oldest uh, parts of the world which contain the PGE metals uh, are largely places where we find uh, old remnants of uh, depressions, uh, or, which also created the lips, you know, the large igneous uh, provinces. So Bushveld being the oldest. Uh, and so we find platinum and rare elements in granite rocks of the times of uh, like those. Now, this image is something that we see, uh, which we imagine is how Earth would have cooled and water vapor was being created by the action of not just meteorites and asteroids colliding on Earth, but also the action of volcanoes that was producing a vast array of gases. And this is a crucial point in Earth his, Earth's history because this is when the formation of the earliest uh, atmosphere was happening. And the atmosphere was at this time devoid of oxygen. So we don't have an ozone layer and we don't have any uh, uh, you know, oxygen to uh, promote the life that we know now. So the first life that emerged around this time, we're looking at this image being around 3.5 billion years old, when the Earth is still being pummeled by asteroids, 
we are looking at the chem, you know, the what are what are called in biology chemoautotrophs. That means depending on chemicals like uh, sulfides and bisulfides and hydrogen sulfide and methane gas, but not oxygen. Oxygen became a byproduct of water and other elements and as water got created, oxygen started to build up and the earliest atmosphere and the ozone hole started to form. So not until about 2 billion years ago did this creature called the stromatolite with the colonies of uh, blue-green algae, what we call cyanobacteria, which partnered with one another, begin to create oxygen, the first free oxygen. And we started to get uh, the first oxides because once the excess oxygen had filled the atmosphere, the rest of the oxygen started to react with metals and we got ferric oxide and ferrous oxide and we got all the other kinds of oxides that we see today. So a humble tribute to this wonderful creature that now lives only in some pockets of the world, Hamlin Bay, for example, or in the Bahamas. Uh, we in India have a majestic collection of stromatolites. Unfortunately, it's being used to make uh, fertilizer like this one. It's from Sonbhadra. Uh, not too far from where you are, uh, I would encourage you to go to Sonbhadra Obra Forest and see this beautiful uh, stromatolite. Uh, this is now being used to make toothpaste. So we've got only about, uh, we've got a stay order in 2016-17 to protect the last, uh, you know, rock formation which had these uh, stromatolites. So, uh, you know, otherwise stromatolites are used for making fertilizer, toothpaste, anything, you know. So I think uh, that's something that we have to start looking at that can we start conserving the remnants of the earliest creatures that gave us oxygen and therefore enabled the creation of more complex life, including multicellular creatures. This is how we live now, right? Now, if you remember the first image that I showed you was the creation of uh, Earth itself. The second image that I showed you was about the creation of uh, noxious gases and meteorites colliding with one another. The third image I showed you was that of stromatolites, which produced all the oxygens and therefore crea created all the oxides. This is the fourth stage in the, in the history of life, where human-made chemicals are brought to fore and they lie exposed and remain undigested by any life form. So you see plastic, you see chemicals, many of which are unknown to uh, even human beings. You know, there are so many of these that are being tried and tested by chemical companies or pharmaceutical companies. And if they are not found to be useful, they're just dumped, right? And we have a colossal amount of waste in just about every city in India. Now, I, I don't know whether this is taught to you in the school of geology, but I just thought uh, this is the only lesson I have for you. I want you to remember that uh, the first image that I showed you that when the uh, two planetary bodies collided and created Earth and Moon, that was the age when we had about 350 minerals, right? And once the crust and the mantle started to work and got pummeled by the action of meteorites and asteroids and new minerals started to come, they started to fuse, we had about 1,500 minerals. And then when the stromatolites came and emerged and started to take over the fringes of where water met land, stromatolites produced oxygen and we had a array of oxides and carbonates and further many other nitrates and sulfates and many other forms of oxygen mediated compounds. And finally, the last image that I showed you, which is how humans started to make chemicals. And this is the age of the Anthropocene. And when we see all the synthetic chemicals that are accumulating all around us, including our bodies, right? Including a term that was coined last year, which appeared in the magazine Nature, the scientific journal Nature, which they called it placenta, which is plastic that is found in fetuses and newborn babies. They have not come out of the mother's womb, but they have traces of plastic and dioxin. Now, we imagine that a baby that has come into life will be pure and would not have any uh, traces of elements or, or, or synthetic chemicals. But, uh, you know, surely there is plastic, surely there's DDT, even if DDT has got phased out in the 1970s. I'm not going to lament about that. I'm just going to come straight to my point and I'm going to tell you how I look at the geological history of India. 
Uh, I like to travel by road, uh, usually buses, uh, so that I can get down at every village uh, I can and also not take the, you know, the bad stairs of my driver because drivers want to go from point A to point B and not stop anywhere in between. So I take buses, uh, state buses, which go through state highways. And I'm, I want to take you through a typical journey from Jodhpur to Jaisalmer. I'm sure there are some students who have been here. It's something that you must have seen very often. So please pardon me if it is a repetition. But I'm just going to say that if you come to the city of Jodhpur, you are greeted by a majestic uh, fort, which is called the Mehrangarh Fort. It sits on this maroon uh, rock, which is now on the on the surface, very uh, friable, very exposed, uh, very uh, looks uh, pretty crumbly. But if you were to pay attention to it when it is being quarried, you see these tall columns, very typical of volcanic rock. I mean, you see andesite, which is like this. You see basalt like this. So, for example, anybody from Mumbai or anybody who's seen a lot of old Hindi films like uh, Hum, Hum Hindustani, I don't know whether you've seen that film with Sunil Dutt. And the song is taking place, Ham Hindustani, where Sunil Dutt is singing, uh, you know, before workers. Please notice the rock behind, and you will notice that it, is, it looks a, li a little like this. But this rock is rhyolite. It's not basalt, right? Of course, I'm not going to get into the details of the differences between the silicate and magnesium contents and the, the bond, uh, nature of the bonding of the, uh, of the minerals. I'm just going to say that this is uh, something called rhyolite, which is typical. It's, this province is called the Malani rhyolite. Beautiful uh, maroon rock, but you also find some uh, 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 volcanic tuff, uh, or some people call it tuff. Uh, you find the glassy structures and the, uh, the uh, volcanic ash embedded in this. Uh, it's extremely beautiful to look at, uh, but it's being uh, cut and you know harvested or extracted in ways which are looking pretty unsustainable. So at one level, why we harvest forest and water and say you know life forms are getting extinct. Rock systems are also getting extinct. If you were to look at different rock forms across India, rocks are also getting extinct because we are harvesting them or extracting them uh, in an unsustainable fashion. We think they are an unlimited supply. That's not true. I'm just going to move on to my next destination and I come and see this wonderful quartzite, uh, which is on the western side of uh, uh, of the Aravali is the western fringe of the Aravali that I encounter for the first time. Look at the beautiful lattice pattern that you see when uh, sandstone from below is heated and you see creeping of uh, silicates happening on top. It gives a glassy structure. Uh, extremely beautiful to look at, uh, uh, not eroded by the desert wind, uh, despite the heat and the uh, assault of the dust particles. Sorry. Uh, I just want to bring you to the uh, the image of, you know, when we're talking about this, we're talking about the Malani rhyolite happening, the event, the Malani event, the volcanic activity happening 750 million years ago. India is in the yellow star on top. India was submerged under ice at this time. So imagine the, the Rajasthan that we're talking about, or even Patna, just now being under a 100 meter uh, layer of ice. And I'm going to show you evidence of that as well. But it was the Malani event which actually caused the defreezing of uh, much of the earth from this time because it was a huge um, igneous event. And uh, the village of Malani, of course, is uh, very pretty. I hope uh, you will go and see that type locality and the rock there. It's, it's really fascinating. Uh, notice that Greenland, which is in the red star, is south of the equator. It's a tropical paradise. India is... Uh, like Greenland or Iceland under ice. So, you know, that's the, the, the paradox that time plays with uh, different lands and different uh, times. I just come across uh, a northwest of Ocean. Now, this feature does not appear in the geological survey map. And I am intrigued that, you know, there's this small uh, hillock with this beautiful uh, deposit of sedimentary rock, thinly layered, something that you see in the Vindhyas, uh, somewhere near Pachmari or Bori. You know, if you have traveled there, you would know what I'm talking about. Um, I presume that this is uh, Silurian or uh, early Devonian because I found scales of fish and teeth which are very similar to the one that you find in the Nishad Bagh, the lower Nishad Bagh formation. So I'm not sure what this is. And I have reported this rock to the JSI office in Jaipur. 
and they are yet to make an examination of this site. I'm, I'm intrigued by it because I, have, uh, I really don't know where this comes from. And it is very rich in uh, fish fossil and, uh, you know, uh, two universities, one in uh, Jodhpur and another in Jaipur, are looking at uh, the fossils, uh, the very tiny fish fossils and scales that you find here. I move on, I come to this abandoned phosphate mine. Notice the banded structure that you see where the sunlight is uh, quite visible. Uh, you can see the banded nature of it. I'm not sure whether this is banded, uh, 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 you know, banded uh, stromatolite. I presume it is because the age uh, kind of conforms with stromatolite that are found on the surface, which is very related to the Jamarkotra uh, ones that are found in Udaipur. But this is northwest of Osean, just before the Bab boulder beds. I now come to, yeah, so I just wanted to tell you what stromatolite was just in case, but stromatolite need not be in cabbage or uh, rounded structures. They can be linear. You can find them in long, uh, thin, striated structures. Uh, it's a common myth that uh, people uh, expect to see uh, stromatolite in this uh, common structure. Uh, that's not true. Uh, although majority of them are in this uh, this form, uh, you can find them in very thin, long uh, rock, uh, uh, very much like sedimentary rocks. You come to very, very interesting rocks. These are needle-shaped uh, polychaete uh, tunnels that are burrows of uh, what are called ichthyo fossils, um, uh, uh, sorry, ichno fossils. And you can see nail-like structures. These are burrows of uh, ancestor of the uh, uh, marine worm nearies. Uh, we were blessed to have a, a very interesting uh, paleontologist who was at the site from Australia, who was also intrigued and uh, was uh, a, a soft invertebrate uh, expert. And it could see him that we were able to see this. It was a chance uh, discovery. Um, while turning rocks, you come across uh, uh, you know, hazards like this scorpion. Uh, many of you know that uh, scorpions were among the earliest uh, creatures to have crossed uh, from the sea, uh, first invertebrates to make land their home. I was criticized when I wrote about this in 2016 that you can't say about something like this in your book Indica. Now, I believe there's a paper by Wellbrook that came out in 2021, which actually says that the oldest, oldest colonizers on land were the ancestors of uh, of the scorpion and got published in Nature. Uh, my evidence came from uh, uh, genomic studies, uh, paleogenomic studies, and I was basing it on that because clearly it was not crustaceans, uh, marine crustaceans that made land their home. To my mind, it was always a creature like a centipede or a scorpion because looking at their genetic structures, you would be able to imagine that they had the ability to survive on land as well as water with, uh, with, uh, with more ease than any other crustacean or any other arachnid for that matter. Uh, I'll move on quickly. I mean, desert comes up with beautiful rocks. You find this uh, uh, granite uh, with a thin layer of sedimentary rock with a, uh, with a desert varnish. Uh, desert varnish, as most of you know, is a delightful process. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's something that lends beauty. It gives a shine to the rock because of that abrasive nature of uh, the sand grains that keep rubbing on it. And of course, the deposit of uh, minerals, which whenever there's light amount of precipitation. So you get this color as well as smoothing that you generally don't see in many other rocks. So desert varnish is something that someone uh, that we must celebrate because it's a uh, it, it lends uh, an immense amount of beauty to rocks. Uh, more uh, marine fossils, uh, this time in an iron-rich, uh, again, phosphate mine, but um, uh, you see the maroon color. It's uh, largely lent by the iron that was leached from the Blani event 750 million years ago. But the sedimentary rock here is from the mid-Jurassic period. Uh, we know this because we also found uh, uh, two uh, gastropods which were classically uh, from the Jurassic period. Um, road cuts are amazing. I don't know whether uh, we have, uh, you know, celebrated our road cuts. But if you were to go to many parts of the world, including Korea, uh, even Bangladesh, I mean, I was surprised that in uh, Chittagong Hill Tracts, there are two road cuts that have labels, which actually give you the, the geological age of all these rocks from the basement rock at the bottom to, you see the calcareous rocks that are there on top, the two white ones. 
and you see a silicate rich rock you see uh, those large boulders on top rounded which perhaps are from glacial deposit because this was very close to the bab boulder bed so i presume it could be a transport a more recent transportation of from of rocks from the bab boulder bed but i could be wrong the problem is nobody has actually analyzed this or even tried to attempt to understand how this wonderful uh, road cut section uh, needs to be deciphered uh eventually we come to bab boulder bed it's it's very similar to the talcher uh, uh formation if uh, if anybody has traveled to talcher uh, in odisha or the talcher formation exposed next to uh, very close to ranchi uh, uh and between ranchi and khunti uh, you got these wonderful exposures now notice that you see these rounded rocks all around you typical of glacial uh, uh, uh dropping from uh, glaciers as they are about to meet the sea Uh, you find them littered all over in the bab pokhran boulder bed beautiful and you see uh, uh, lovely uh, uh, rocks that have been shaped uh, uh, billions of years ago and it's hard to imagine that this is now one of the hottest part of india was once submerged in uh, you know uh, meters and meters high uh, ice uh, packs you know so it is so yeah it's so interesting to note that uh, you know how the destiny of land changes over millions of years uh, again a very elegant example of uh, you know the scraping and the grating that um, uh, glaciers do on sandstone so you notice that this is a very old sandstone i can i don't know what age this would be but you can see the movement of water uh, that happens between the glacier and the rock as it's crossing very slowly you know talking about a couple of inches a year as it's moving uh the the friction of the ice uh, ice pack or the ice berg itself on the rock is creating some heat but also a escape of water and it creates these channels and it's very beautiful to notice this uh, in uh, in the bab boulder bed i come to a place uh, which is next to uh, a, a hill about uh, 12 km short of jaisal uh, and you know earlier this was just classic and early cretaceous this is when the uh you know the the lagoon was depositing a lot of limestone and you got uh, a variety of these shells getting trapped day in and day out with the sediment load crushing it so you have in abur a uh, lot of quarries that are taking out this uh, this uh, stone for which now is found in just about uh, receptions of every hotel or office and of course they made an entire fort out of it in in jaisalmer but again my it's my belief that you know we have to keep some segments of this rock preserved for the future because i i i have this innate fear that some rocks are going to go extinct um, even before we've made full discoveries about it um and this is another it's like uh, in a uh, any of my friends who here who collect stamps there's something called tate bash which means when the colors go uh, are inverted so sometimes the shells pick up the phosphate color and the background picks up the iron manganese rich uh, element and so you get an inversed color image this again is a abur limes uh, limestone it's very rare to see it but it does occur in in the region i then i want to show you very quickly uh, you know i've moved huge swathes of time and i don't have to uh, tell you what happened at what time because you are geologists you know the the time series better than i do just want to bring this to your attention that you know 50 million years ago india was moving at great pace towards um, uh, uh, what is now tibet and you know there was a large sea called tethys extending from shanghai to gibraltar you know and the and as you know tethys was the laboratory if i can use that word or, or the seat of innovation where all mammalian uh, uh, innovations took place uh, i mean of course um, the most important of those was the uh, invention of the whale how an animal left land and took to sea which is a uh, is a is a wonderful story by itself and india has a wonderful wonderful collection of uh, whale uh, fossils and fortunately we don't celebrate it enough india and pakistan have a very good collection of whale fossils and so does egypt for that matter but yeah we've not done enough in terms of saving uh, those fossils or even putting them together what the reason why i bring this up is because this is the time before the modern era comes to uh, you know 
come to rest. And you can see that most of the land masses, Australia has come to its place, Greenland is still green. There is no North Pole. If you notice, there's no Arctic uh, uh, land mass in the Arctic. It's an open space. Antarctica is still green and it's got um, large uh, flightless birds that are still living there. And they've crossed over to the Southern Hemisphere, uh, the land bridges being there, including in Madagascar and uh, Australia, New Zealand and South America. Uh, in India, we had the ostrich. India gave ostrich to Africa. It's not the other way around. So India was rich with ostriches, uh, something that we don't celebrate. Um, it collides and the Tethys Sea is closed, but you know, smaller lakes within the Tethys and between the land masses are also incredible places where innovations are taking place. Uh, as the Tibet uh, flow rises up, you start seeing that Antarctica now has permanent ice sheets and you are going to see the freezing of the uh, Arctic. So keep your eyes up uh, when you you know, when you see the latter maps. The reason why I bring this up is because as the lakes were closing up, you saw some of these lakes deposit a lot of sediment and load. And one of the things that it created were fuller earth mines. Now, we have beautiful fuller earth mines in, in Rajasthan and even uh, south, uh, Himal uh, south of Himachal Pradesh. Um, Fuller's Earth, as you know, is called Multani Mitti, and it's a great place to hunt fossils. So if you go to uh, Multani Mitti site, you will see this is the uh, kind owner who let me use his uh, mine for hunting fossils. You find custard apple. Now, custard apple got reintroduced into India in the 17th century from by the Portuguese. They discovered it in Brazil, and they got it back to India. But, you know, here's evidence that uh, custard apple was uh, in India in much of the Gondwana land, and it got serially extinct in Africa and India in Sri Lanka. And uh, I don't know if there's any evidence of uh, custard apple from Australia, but there is fossil evidence and, of course, now uh, living uh, relatives of the ancestors of the custard apple, which you see before you. Uh, you find uh, giant coconuts. I mean, this is not a small coconut. I've found much larger coconuts, but that's me holding it in case you want to see the lower half of my body. And that's me. Uh, that's the coconut fossil. Look at the beautiful preservation of the fibers. Uh, it just enthralls me uh, how it gets saved. And I found snakes. I found fish. I found an entire bat, which I've given to a uh, uh, college, uh, uh, the Institute of uh, ISM Dhanbad. I've given them a bat fossil, uh, which I found there uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, Bikaner. This is this is a scene from Bikaner. Uh, I find a very, very rare uh, mushroom uh, called Rhodomycium ashby, which is uh, rarely seen. In fact, uh, uh, there are only three or four photographs of this. I was lucky to have a photograph. So I've circulated it to all the mycologists in the world. It had just rained and I was uh, actually chasing a group of chinkaras and I saw one chinkara feeding on it. And I wasn't sure what is it feeding on the sand because I couldn't see any grass. And that's when I spotted this. And I asked a mycologist friend of mine in Oxford that, do you know what this is? He said, I think you've just hit treasure. This, is not been, this has not been seen or photographed for many, many years. Where is this from? What is it? Do you, did you preserve it? Do you have spores? You know, all those kind of questions. I said, no, 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 no. I just have a photograph. And this is Rhodothesium uh, uh, ashby. Uh, I just want to show you that, you know, I like to imagine Earth in, um, you know, what is underneath it and what happened millions and billions of years ago. So this is a cross-section of between uh, Rashpati Bhavan and Gurgaon. So for, uh, I'm sure most of you have been into in Delhi. So, I mean, I like to imagine uh, where are the mountains underneath it? You know, the Ravalis have got inundated. Uh, they were majestic mountains, perhaps as tall as the Himalayas now. Uh, you know, about 2 billion years ago, but, uh, you know, now they are just foothills or, you know, not as high as they were. But, you know, their majesty has got inundated by alluvium, which has got deposited over the last 50 million years. But I still want to imagine how they would look underneath it. So I've tried to draw this, uh, for you know, just to tell people that, you know, this is how it looks like. And, you know, what's underneath the Rashpati Bhavan? Why does the Rashpati Bhavan stand on a you know, a kind of a mound, you know, those two mounds that uh, on which Ra uh, Rashpati Bhavan and uh, North and South Block exist. So I just wanted to make that quite apparent that there was a uh, something deep 
you know, that rose as a wave, uh, which is a quartzite, as you know. It's a, it's a beautiful red-orange quartzite. So I'm just going to take you to a short cultural history of how we show dinosaurs. Uh, so I've been collecting uh, images of dinosaurs from cartoon books and literature in India. So there's a, here's a brief. I just don't want to go into, I mean, I've got over 2,000 images, but I don't want to show you all of them. Uh, so here's a, a Bangla uh, children's book, and there's Lodeport, if, I mean, people who know Diamond Comics, uh, a lot of you would know. You know, uh, dinosaurs were, even when in the 80s and 90s, we knew more about the dinosaur. I think, uh, of course, I don't expect uh, our cartoonists to be uh, paleontologists or being literate about uh, uh, dinosaurs or the times of the past. But I'm, I, I find that this message that dinosaurs were terrible creatures in XYZ is something that has perpetuated time. And this, this is something which is more recent. You know, This is uh, something from 1998 and 1999. Uh, uh, even then, uh, we tend to show dinosaurs. And in the main comic books, they are also called dinosaurs. So they're not pretending it to be any other creature, but they are calling it a dinosaur. So that's what uh, worries me. Had it been called an alien creature or called anything else and given it a name, I would be fine. Uh, in fact, Hindi cinema, uh, it's a terrible film, but uh, if you're actually interested in seeing Dara Singh and Mumtaz, please see this film. It's a real torture, but you know they actually call it a dinosaur and they throw uh, Dara Singh uh, to fight the dinosaur. And of course, you know who wins. Um, and yeah, this is a snapshot from the film. Uh, then there is something which is inspired from a Godzilla called Golgola from 1966. Now, if anybody from Bombay would recognize this is Princess Street. Uh, and the lady on the bottom is this uh, very, very nice uh, conversational, chatty, uh, grand old woman of Indian cinema called Tabassum. And she was the heroine of this film. Uh, terrible film again. Uh, nothing... Uh, complimentary said about a uh, soul dinosaur. I can't imagine why a sea-dwelling creature could stand up erect the way it is. Your body mass should not permit it. We get everything wrong. I think even Godzilla as a, uh, as a creature should have actually died because of the G-force acting on it. Because if it li lives in benthic layers of the oceans and it comes out on, on land, how does it survive the pressure? I can't imagine any... Uh, adaptation in the lungs or the gut uh, that prevents it from collapsing, right? So these are questions that as scientists we should ask. Um, more recently, there's this uh, film starring Mithun Chakravarti, Jackie Shroff about this grand creature living. It's a dinosaur. Again, they call it a dinosaur. And this is how it looks like. It's outside of Dum Dum, uh, you know, Dum Dum Park. Uh, if you, uh, anybody from Kolkata would know this, this is near, uh, you know, the um, um, you know, on the way to the airport. Um, but, you know, look at this creature. Now, speaking purely from the point of evolution, a giant creature like this living in the tropical forest would be a disaster. You know, it would get stuck in trees. It has extraordinarily long teeth, which are used only for hunting fish. I mean, no other creature generally has these kind of teeth. It's only seen in creatures that hunt fish, you know, Spinosaurus, for example, or even the deep sea angling fish. Uh, or the viper fish, you know, they have teeth like that. And, you know, from all evolutionary perspectives, uh, this creature should not be existing. So I think while uh, we must let uh, Bangla film industry imagine what they want to, but as scientists, we must laugh it off and say that, you know, no dinosaur could be like this. You know, it's just unimaginable to have a creature like this. So I'm just going to now tell you why I am interested in deep natural history. I think uh, I think uh, if we are looking at climate change or we are looking at preserving anything in our lives, we, we should understand things from the deep perspective. Landscapes, rocks, anything that we see before us have a role to play in the larger milieu of things. And I think it helps us build a perspective. It also brings in a sense of humility because if things lived in different conditions and different times, I think we must now recognize that there are things in nature that provide us with answers. And I think scientists need to inform policymakers to see things further, to see things in better resolution, and to see things further. And I think geologists, more than anybody, 
have a role to play in terms of informing policymakers because geology is going to be the future of climate change. Remember that 22% of daily carbon sinking is done by just one geological uh, landscape, and that's the Ganga, right? Uh, people imagine that, uh, you know, the tropical rainforests of Amazon capture all the carbon. Well, that's a big fallacy. The, big, the most carbon capture that happens is by the action of cyanobacteria that live in eight meters of the seas and oceans of the seas uh, of the world. And their action uh, and the action of viruses that kill them, what are called cyanophages, which I talk about in my book. And the next most important thing is the Ganga. Now, if you were to shut either of the two, you would not have enough oxygen the next day and you would have no carbon burial. Okay? It would disrupt the entire carbon oxygen cycle that happens in the ocean. So I think geologists now need to take a more important role in policy making nationally as well as globally. If you were to look at the climate change documents, the IPCC, they don't mention geological features. They don't mention geologists. In fact, there are no geologists on the on board. In fact, the, the geologists that exist on the board are those who are who represent the petroleum industry or the coal industry. Not there to talk about carbon capture, but they're talking about carbon emission. And the role of geologists is going to be on carbon capture. And this is my final slide before I close. Uh, I think why what we must do as people who are interested in science communication and promoting uh, curiosity, I think we have, we need to focus a lot on making our education more inclusive. Geology is not just geology. It's got an element of chemistry, physics, biology, geography. Where was that piece of land when the, the rock got created? How it moved during various times? When did it get oxidized or reduced? When did it get fissures? When did, when did the pegmatite rise? Why did the pegmatite become the way it did? You know, all those things inform you. Thing is, we don't connect the dots. We look at an event in a singular uh, way, and we do not like to encourage curiosity or critical thinking. I think that's the biggest failure that education of any kind, and I'm not blaming ge geology here alone. I'm just saying we need to bring a broader mindset when it comes to science and the counterfactual in, in the sense that science should be able to uh, answer questions that are complex and answer it from several scientific perspectives. Climate change is an example. Like I gave you the example of the Ganga. Even today, there is no recognition that why Ganga ka pani is pure, even when you keep it. The answer is in the silicates. It's, there's no other answer to it. And the answer was given to us by Harold Urey in 1936. You know, the thing is, we did not read the, uh, the, the, the paper that he wrote on chemistry or, or rather uh, biochemistry. That's because biochemistry to our minds has no link with geology, but it has because that's the thing that we are trying to prove that we have not found a satisfactory answer that why Ganga's water does not decompose is because silicates prevent the action of uh, biological accumulation. It only talks about carbon capture in form of organic form. It does, oh, sorry, in, a, in organic form. It does not promote organic growth, the Ganga water. So that's the more important thing we need to understand. And the, finally, my point is that I know that we have space crunches and you know, institutions are, uh, you know, have, have limited spaces, all, all those things and, and resource crunches. And I, I understand that completely. But what prevents us from doing small things in our corridors or in our lobbies or in the entrances or open spaces? Let's not have grand museums, you know. Why can't we have a, a collection of stromatolites and say, this is the story of oxygen. If you want to know how all the oxygen got created, why can't we have a small museum of the Ganga? You know, just collect small things from different parts of the Ganga and say, this is how this silicate got formed. And you know, these are the kind of uh, 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 granites that are formed in different parts of the Himalayas, which feed into the, the Ganga's uh, silica richness, right? So I'm only saying that, you know, we don't have to have a, a 
you know, very grand museums. I think every department, uh, whether it's history, geography, biology, should have one display which tells us neat story about something which is very important to us. So I'd again like to thank uh, the organizers and wish uh, the Patna, uh, Geol Patna University's geology department a hearty congratulations for the 75 years. And I look forward to the next 75 years. Of course, I won't be there, but I, I'm sure uh, you know it would go from strength to strength and create leaders and inspire people to think creatively and uh, find solutions to problems that we are going to leave behind for them. Thank you so much. And thank you, Professor Mitra, for inviting me. Thank you, uh, Praneji, and uh, I'm thankful to Dr. Arvind Mitra also for providing me the contact details of Pranay Lalji. But still, uh, the audience, the students and the faculty members would like to have a glimpse of uh, Pranay Lalji. You have presented. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I preemptively did that. Namaste, namaste. Uh, so nice, uh, uh, very nice presentation. And before we uh, formally propose a vote of thanks, I request the students of our department or faculty members if they wish to uh, have any query related to the presentation. So the students, uh, one or two questions we may invite. Otherwise, uh, you can also have uh, any comments on the presentation which you had just now. Can I just put a right or please don't ask me very technical geological questions. I, uh, you know, I, I really am not competent enough to answer questions, but you know, anything uh, around my uh, I'll be happy to. Uh, really, uh, the way you have presented your uh, observations, the geological findings, it is uh, really eye-opener for the faculty members and the students uh, how to look nature and how to look the geological uh, episodes which have gone uh, earlier. So really, we have learned, we have learned a lot. Uh, and the students particularly, when they move on to the field, how they observe and what would be the methodology of observing and understanding the geological uh, the structures or the formations and uh, to interpret uh, in uh, their own perspective. So uh, any students? Uh, I think students, they are all mesmerized and uh, they are just thinking about the presentations which you had. So uh, without uh, uh, taking uh, much time, formally, uh, I express my gratitude to Pranel Alji for his really Excellent presentation. I'm going to the book presented by uh, Dr. Arvind Mitra, sir, the Indica, and I have covered a few pages, really eye-opener for uh, me as a faculty. And uh, uh, really, uh, your dimension of looking at the things of geology, the beautiful illustrations which you have made and showed us, uh, that is not a amateurish, that is very professional, the dinosaur uh, which you have made, that wonderful presentation. And one now, uh, uh, just uh, observation, uh, you have uh, mentioned about the Geological Museum, uh, definitely. Uh, in the Platinum Jubilee year of our department, we are um, developing a field museum. Though we have a nice uh, geological museum uh, for the benefit of the students, the school children, etc. of the city, they used to visit the uh, complex. But we wish to uh, enrich. Uh, and uh, earnestly, I request you to visit Patna and visit the Department of Geology so that we get enriched by your ideas and your suggestions to beautify and uh, present our department in the, the university campus. So this is the uh, uh, third series in the Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series. Uh, I'm thankful to my senior, Dr. Arvind Mitra. He's always uh, very, very encouraging to all of us. In student days, we have been guided by his uh, very, very uh, positive note towards the students, how to look the society and how to build character in the university premises. So uh, Dr. Arvind Kumarji is also visible in the other screen, which is there. He's the undergraduate head of the department. And on behalf of the Department of Geology, <laughs> Just a small uh, token of uh, love and appreciation. This is the logo which we uh, which we have developed on the Platinum Jubilee celebration. So we'd like to have this uh, to you. We'd like to have your uh, postal address so that we can immediately send uh, this memento to the uh, Mr. Pranella. So with these words, once again, I am uh, thankful to you. And I wish that these students will maybe they may keep interaction with you in time to come. 
So thank you, Mitra sir, and thank you, Pranal Alji. I'm thankful to all my students and the faculty members who have joined this program. This uh, program has been recorded and it will be also available on the YouTube. So thank you all of you once again. Thank you, sir.